Alright, number 5. I assume if you're watching a review on the 5th game, you already know how Jackbox works to follow the setup and all that. So, I'm just gonna jump straight in. By the way, I have a Jackbox Discord server now where you can hop in and play some Jackbox with some like-minded folk. And before you ask why not just use the official Jackbox server, that's because that server doesn't have a single voice call where you can talk and stream. So why don't you do some research first before you ask STUPID QUESTIONS! I sincerely apologize about that sudden outburst. I will be making my full apology video this Wednesday. You don't know Jack Fullstream. Despite being the company's signature series, I mean, they're called Jackbox games after all. Prior to 5, the last time we saw You Don't Know Jack was in the first party pack. I would say I'm surprised, but given how just about every other trivia game they've done has had warmer reception, I'm really not. That's not to say You Don't Know Jack is bad though. In fact, this version in particular is the very first time the series supported 8 players opposed to 4. And with a 10k audience feature to boot. Although the audience feature specifically doesn't really amount to much, since they just sort of play along with no substantial effect on the actual players. For the uninformed, You Don't Know Jack is a trivia game where the questions are deliberately asked in the most indirect way possible. For example, there was a question that asked what you should do if the national animal of France was right behind you, with all of the answers being what said animal would do. This is opposed to straight up asking, hey, what's the national animal of France? And then providing the name of four different animals. So if you're just as bad at trivia as as I am, things are made even more difficult because now instead of trying to figure out the answer, you're trying to figure out the question to something you wouldn't even know the answer to anyway. Credit where credit is due. The creativity is on point. And if you are a trivia buff, you'll appreciate You Don't Know Jack for likely being one of the most clever games of trivia you've ever played. But that's really the problem right there. I find games like Fibbage or Trivia Murder Party have a wider appeal due to all the other elements a player can excel at. Trivia is always the focus of these games, of course. But if you're good at making up lies, or avoiding death via terrifying minigames, you can still get by, and the game is more engaging for that. And you don't know Jack, the only component that would engage a player that isn't a fan of trivia is the high energy presentation the game provides. Although the full stream version of YDKJ staggers a bit in this area compared to previous entries due to the binge pipe gimmick introduced. So traditionally, you don't know Jack is, well, you don't know Jack. It's all very game showy in nature. However, here in full stream, it's all under the guise of a fictional stream streaming service called BingePipe, an evil streaming company with ulterior motives. It's sort of funny for a quick giggle, but the additional transitions and the handful of interruptions are not a good trade-off for the just okay-ish comedy that BingePipe provides. I mean, don't get me wrong, the interruptions aren't even that frequent or that long, but it does make the overall game take about a minute longer on average from the version present in Party Pack 1, which, while not terrible, I already thought the previous version of YDKJ went on a bit too long as is. Alright, well, what else is new? Surely it's not all bad. And yeah, there's some really good additions here. As the name You Don't Know Jack full stream would suggest, the big selling point of this version is that you can effectively stream this game through Discord or Twitch without any concerns of latency ruining the experience. Which was very much the case in Party Pack 1's YDKJ, where the final round, titled Jack Attack, saw players having to buzz in as fast as possible. Instead of watching your TV or stream to buzz in, the way it's handled here is answers will appear on your phone, and if an answer matches the category, you tap it before the time bar depletes. All players have the same answers, but picking an answer will not take away that answer from other players. It's an elegant solution. And even latency aside, I prefer how it's handled here opposed to previous versions of the game. Beyond some new round categories relating to binge pipe, the only other standout change is that now, the screws provided to players who are losing will now negatively affect all players in a variety of obnoxious ways. Stuff like the answers all bouncing around your screen, to a bunch of pop-ups you need to close out of before you can answer. Overall, I think I would say this version of YDKJ is marginally better than the version we saw in the first part pack, if for not the 8 player and streaming support alone. But there are better trivia centric games in other party packs, and the unforgiving design choice of having players lose points for not getting the right answer generally leads to games where the winner is the person least in debt. Split the Room. This is a would you rather game where up to 8 players and an audience create hypothetical situations the other players will later vote on. Basically you're provided a premise. Something like, you've been tasked with killing a werewolf that eats people's pets. When you go to the werewolf's den, you find out that it's been keeping blank from overrunning the town. Do you still kill the werewolf? You get to fill in that blank. And the idea is to create such a divisive hypothetical, players have a hard time deciding on whether to vote yes or no, because the more split the vote is, the more points you get. You also get bonus points dependent on how long it took players to reach an answer. Although I don't think this feature worked quite in the way Jackbox games intended. And more on that later. All of the prompts are single fill in the blanks with yes or no responses until the final round, where you are again provided a 
another hypothetical, but this time, one of the options will be decided for you, and you have to provide the other. It's a bit gross, but one hypothetical I did was that you're falling off a building, and you can either choose to land on a pedestrian, which will severely injure them, or what I decided to input, which was landing in a pool of piss. The obvious predicament being, do you swallow your pride and just land in the pee, or do you take the selfish route and injure a dude? On top of this, the final round will ask you to predict what you think a certain player will vote for, and if you get it right, you get some bonus points. Between the prediction and how split your previous prompts were, the player with the most points at the end wins. I think I prefer the final round because the provided option can be used as a reference point. As to say, you just need to make something that is comparable to the in-game choice. This is opposed to the previous rounds where sometimes the prompt is so one-sided. Players will instinctively vote yes or no regardless of what you enter, which unfortunately leads us to the many issues of Split the Room. The biggest shortcoming is that the format in place here is just way too restrictive. I know there's people out there who think hypotheticals are annoying or whatever, but for myself personally, and I'm sure many others, hypotheticals or would-you-rathers are a whole lot of fun. For that to be translated into a game, you would think it would lead to something a little more crazy and thought-provoking than yes or no prompts. Come on, you could do something way more open-ended than that. Like how about giving each player a bunch of multiple choice selections to fine-tune a personalized hypothetical? You could do something like this, right? For the first two boxes, you can select from a few options, and then for the last bit, you can write in whatever you want. For example, you could have, for blank, pick a selection here. You could either blank, pick selection there, or blank, type in whatever you want here. Doing something of this nature would not only open the game up to way more comedy, but more importantly, it would allow you more opportunities to create actually engaging hypotheticals. Other lesser criticisms, but still criticisms all the same, would be that, one, the audience is really poorly implemented here. No matter how many players you have in your audience, it could be five or 500, they only count as one vote. Why? Wouldn't a larger sample size be a better indicator of how close the split was? I mean, what if for the first round, you're playing with six people that all pick yes, but then most of the people in the audience all pick no? It feels weird to punish you just because those particular players who would have led to a more even split were in the audience opposed to being an actual player. The only reason I could rationalize this decision is that maybe they thought that if you had eight players in a single audience vote, it would be easier to get a 50-50 split. But that doesn't make much sense anyways, because if you have an even number of players, audience or not, you can never get a perfect split regardless. So just count every vote, whether it's from an audience member or not, individually. Two, the whole thing of equating extra points to the amount of time the players took to choose an answer doesn't work well. I understand how this could make sense on paper. The correlation is that if someone is taking a long time to answer, it must be a really good hypothetical, right? Rarely is this actually the case, though. In most situations, if someone is taking a long time to vote, it's because they're not paying attention. Plus, given the restrictions, it's not like any of these hypotheticals would be head scratchers anyway. And three, on the final round where you have to vote on what choice a player will pick, if they're AFK are not paying attention and don't vote you don't get any points. Like, how is that fair? Why should you get punished for someone else not participating? Split the Room is a game that I want to like, and I try to every time I play because basing a game off of strung together would-you-rathers just sounds like it should be fun. But unfortunately, it's distressingly dull and restrictive. This is an idea I really hope Jackbox Games revisits, because I think a game about confronting your peers with abstract situations they need to logically come to a conclusion on is is a great set piece for discussion and entertainment. I commend the team for attempting such an intriguing concept for a game, but as is, Split the Room is a game that could have been, hypothetically, much better. Madverse City. This is a Mad Lib styled game about robots stringing together smooth ass diss tracks in a one on one rap battle. I say Mad Libs because the first line is provided for you. It'll just ask you to enter a noun, verb, adjective, whatever, much like Mad Libs. Then for the next verse, you write anything you want. This structure repeats one more time to create a four line rap. Your rap is pit against another person's rap, and everybody else playing gets a vote on a winner between the two of you. This goes on for three complete rounds, and the person with the most points at the end is the winner. This game goes up to eight players but if you play with an odd number of players, someone will need to go up against the AI gene every round. It's not ideal or anything, but there's really no way around this since each player needs to go up against someone, so I get it. That aside, conceptually, this game kicks ass. I mean, robots destroying a city by engaging in rap battles? I mean, how awesome is that? And when playing with the right group of people, this can be a good time. Although, in comparison to other fill in the blank games, I would say the group you play with needs to be a bit more finely tuned to your style of humor. 
in contrast to something like Quiplash or more recently Job Job, where there's still humor to be found even when everybody's sensibilities don't match up. Madverse City has a feature where you can upvote or downvote players during a rap, and personally, I think this is hands down the worst inclusion in the entire game. It really goes back to the argument of really needing to fine tune the people you play with. When I was playing this in the Jackbox server, there was some dip that was spamming dislikes on every rap, and if a rap gets enough dislikes, there's a record scratch and a handful of other audio cues that can be really manipulative, especially when playing with more impressionable people that can really affect their perception of how someone else did. Even though the reality is that most of the raps that were mass disliked were perfectly fine. This might seem like a minor thing, but it's happened in a few games I've played and it flat out just ruins the entire experience for me every time. And furthermore, it begs the question, why was this added? If the game just let you upvote or downvote a rap once depending on how you felt overall, that would be one thing. But I see no reason to let the players spam the button. The worst part is that anytime this happens in a game, the person doing it is a complete coward and hides behind a design choice of the game not telling you who's downvoting. I'll admit I'm being super petty about this, but this feature alone has completely soured my opinion on the game. Unfortunately, Madverse City has bigger, less petty problems. A big one is that whatever you type will be said out loud by text-to-speech from the robots, which you think would be pretty funny, but it's absolutely terrible. And I don't mean it in a, man, TTS sounds so bad, kind of way. Like, that's the point. Text-to-speech is supposed to sound unnatural. Plus, the general idea of text-to-speech coming out of robots is honestly hilarious. The part about it that is not hilarious is that it will frequently screw up the pronunciation of words that can absolutely ruin verses, and especially rhymes. Glass bars. Go down to meet I understand how somebody could think the TTS botching verses could be funny, but in most situations, I believe it would have been funnier if it just got it right. Either way, the bottom line is that knowing whether or not the text to speech will have a hard time reading off the verse is completely out of the player's control and can even lose them some votes because of it. And that cannot be overlooked. Something I also see happen one or two times a game is the robot straight up cutting off into the next verse before finishing the current line. I can't help it, you're so cute. <laughs> and if a player is spamming a bunch of keys, I get it. But if someone genuinely wrote an entire cohesive line, the game should read off the entire thing. If not, then why even have the character limit be the length that it is if stuff is going to get cut off anyway? I would say this problem is even bigger than the text to speech botching pronunciation, since entire punchlines might not even get delivered when the game does this. Lastly, I wish there was an anonymous robot setting where names weren't listed, and each player got a different robot each round. Don't get me wrong, when you're playing with a close group of friends, being informed on who you're going up against can lead to some really funny personal burns. But if you're playing with a mostly random group of people, the handful of players that do know each other can skew their votes towards or against other players depending on who's performing. I mean, there's a reason games like Quiplash do not identify the players until after the votes are in. And the option would have been nice here too. Another minor critique is that I think the first rapper is at a disadvantage given how long the four verses can sometimes be. Again, comparing to something like Quiplash, the two responses are shown back to back, so you're taking in both responses simultaneously, which leads to a more impartial vote overall. In Madverse City, when it's time to vote, the second rap is obviously going to be the one that's fresh in your mind. Sure, you'll generally know how you felt about the first rap, but being able to actively recite the second rap in your head given you just heard it can create unfair biases if both performances were solid. If I had a guess, there's likely some of you who are astonished to hear such a harsh take on Madverse City. And look, if you like it and typically don't run into these problems, then I don't want anyone to feel like their opinion on the game is invalid or anything. I fully understand that this is among the personal faves for a lot of Jackbox players out there. And again, conceptually, this is a fantastic game. Not even just conceptually though, both the sound design and the art direction are top notch here. I appreciate when a Jackbox game can create its own mini self-contained universe, and Madverse City does that really well. Regardless, while I try my best to be as impartial as possible when looking at these games, the critiques I mentioned are problems I sincerely have. They really have ruined the overall experience for me on several occasions. And I think even players who like this game are at least aware of the hitches I mentioned. Even then, the game just asks you to be too clever for the amount of payoff there is. Because even if a set of rhymes are catchy, it's not like in Quiplash where you can half-ass a response and still get a laugh. You gotta be really on point to even match the comedy you could get from other Jackbox games, even when just playing them casually. And even then, you're still more likely to remember a funny Quiplash response than a full set of rhymes in Madverse. And that's ignoring the problems you can easily run into in Madverse anyway. Overall, Madverse City is not a bad game by any means, and it can be fun with a similar-minded group of friends. But a handful of improvements here can make the overall experience much better.
Zeeble though, I know I've been pretty hard on pack 5 so far, but the reality is that none of the previous 3 games we've looked at are bad. It's just they could have been better. Zeeple Dome, on the other hand, this is the real deal. This game is bad. I know that seems harsh, because it doesn't look awful. The colors are nice, I like the character and the anime designs, and the music is very Splatoony. Eh, just listen, you'll get what I mean. I like it personally. However, this game does not control well. This is mostly due to the decision to design this like an actual arcade style game opposed to the party format most of the Jackbox games are predicated on. In Zeeple Dome, the goal is to defeat monsters by slamming into them. This is done by dragging your finger back in the opposite direction you wish to fling, and then letting go. Very reminiscent to Angry Birds, in fact. There's a set number of waves, and each wave has a different assortment of enemies. Also, there's this annoying thing where when an enemy is about to die, only the player that is the same color as the enemy can kill it. It. And if that player takes too long to take care of the enemy, said enemy gets some of its health back and everybody gets annoyed. Phones are great for the purposes of Jackbox because they're versatile, and everyone has one. I mean honestly, it's the perfect device to play a variety of different games with a different set of rules. Which is why they're such a perfect fit for a social party game compilation such as Jackbox. That being said, there is a reason that controllers with physical input options still exist. The direct feedback you get from a button or a stick is just always going to be better than a flat touchscreen. Even though an analog stick would still be the preferred way to play a game like this, it all doesn't sound too terrible. I mean, Angry Birds controlled alright for what it was, but there are some key differences given the medium here is a website access through your browser. First of all, a game like Angry Birds was not time restricted, so even though touchscreens could be inaccurate, you were given as much time as you needed to line up a shot. Here in Zeeple Dome, however, even though there isn't an overarching timer, the enemies do move around and have a variety of different attacks that you'll need to actively dodge. Touch screens can already be imprecise as is, but when you're playing off a web browser and need to dodge attacks in real time, it puts an ugly spotlight on the controls here. But the controls are the least problematic issue here. The bigger issue is the latency. Holy cow, this game is not even playable unless you are in the same room as the console or computer running Jackbox. And even then it's laggy. But yes, this essentially means this game is absolutely unplayable over streaming. More so than any other Jackbox game, in fact. So there was You Don't Know Jack 2015, which wasn't really streamable because of the final round as mentioned earlier when I was talking about YDK full stream, but perfectly playable otherwise. Then there was Fake In It, which I previously said in my Pack 3 review could not be played over stream because you need to see the other players, but before I even uploaded that review, my friends and I used a Discord chat to play the game via stream, and it actually worked really well. In fact, the face value category in particular where you have to make a specific face based on the prompt is actually more fun through the way that we played it since you just submit an emoji in the chat instead. And now with Zeeble though, especially when looking back at the previous games I once deemed unstreamable. Like, no, this is it. This is the only Jackbox game where it is nearly impossible to play through streaming. You can get away with stuff like YDKJ 2015 and faking it, but it's just not happening here. But even all that aside, even if there was zero latency, even if you had direct inputs through a controller. Zeeple Dome just isn't that fun to begin with. This is the only Jackbox game I straight up cannot get people to play with me, even for footage. I play something like Earwax or Wordspud, and sure, people don't think it's very good, but they'll see it through till the end. I have never been able to finish a game of Zeeple Dome when playing with other people. We'll usually play through like one or two waves, and then someone will go, dude, can we play something else? I should also mention this is the only game in pack 5 that does not go up to 8 players and instead caps it at 6. Also, no audience support. Not that you could have done a whole lot of it anyways. I don't know, you could have maybe had the audience decide where enemies or power-ups spawn or something. Either way, I figured I'd mention it. I don't mind Jackbox trying to do more of a game game to mix things up every now and then, but if they decide to do that, they need to keep the limitations of the touchscreen and server latency in mind. Bomb Corp was more of an actual game, I'd say. But that worked well because even though you had a timer, you didn't need to immediately react to things in real time. Or at least, not in the same way you need to in Zeeple Dome when it comes to dodging enemies and moving across the board. Zeeple Dome is an interesting experiment, and it definitely looks and sounds great, but I can't recommend a game that's biggest setback is physically playing it. Lastly, we have Patently Stupid, which is both a presentation and a drawing game. And honestly, it works pretty well. Up to 8 players are given fill in the blank problems, something like, people are always staring at my blank, or there's never enough time to blank, fill in these prompts, and congrats. 
this. You've created a problem. These problems then get sent amongst all the people playing. You'll be sent two of them, and need to make the decision on which of the two you'd like to solve. Once you pick one, you get to actually draw the solution to the problem you're solving. They're referred to in-game as inventions, although most of the time people just seem to draw things that already exist, or actions to take to solve the issue instead of an actual invention. One time I was playing and someone just drew a guy named Dale as their solution. In fact, it wasn't even a solution. It was just someone experiencing the same problem presented in the prompt. Or if you're feeling particularly lazy, you could just make your invention a gun, which seems to be the go-to solution for solving nearly every problem in this game when I play with randos. So once again, this is another game where you'll want to fine-tune the group you're playing with. Some players prefer to stay within the guidelines and sincerely draw an invention, whilst others will draw a Dale. Of course, if you don't appreciate that somebody took the easy way out instead of coming up with a funny creation, you don't have to back them. That's because after everybody has drawn, named, and presented their inventions, you get to fund three of the inventions your friends have drawn. In most cases, this means to just vote for your top three favorite solutions, but you might want to be cautious of what other players are voting for. Because if you vote for an invention that does not meet the required amount of cash to fund, the player who made said invention keeps the money that you funded to them, and you get nothing. So do you vote for someone else so you can see a monetary return on a pledge? Or do you vote for what you like because screw it, it's a game and games are about having fun. Other Jackbox games such as TKO make similar design choices where often the most strategic way to play is not always the most fun way to play. But fortunately for Patently Stupid, I don't think this particular design choice hinders a game that much. Whether or not you sway your vote to allocate the things you think will win, opposed to things you actually like, doesn't interfere with Patently Stupid's objective of being a funny presentation game, which is the important part. So everyone presents and votes, and then the final round begins, where a randomly selected player gets to choose a problem for everyone to solve. This I'm a bit indifferent to. On one hand, it's cool to see all the different ways you and your friends would approach the same problem. On the other hand, it's really common to see multiple people come up with the same exact solution or invention for the prompt. Seeing a new problem and solution for each individual player in round one leads to much funnier moments than the final round setup leads to. Because when everyone has to come up with a solution for the same problem, even if you do not see a single repeat, you still will have a general idea of what to expect from the prompt alone, which obviously takes away a lot of the unpredictable element associated with strong comedy. Either way, after everyone has presented for a second and final time, you vote for your top three once more, and the player with the most cash at the end wins. Patently Stupid is easily my favorite game in all five, and a lot of that is just due to the fact that there's nothing here that can potentially ruin the gameplay experience. Not to say this is the best Jackbox inclusion ever, or that something like the final round couldn't have been stronger, because it could have. But that aside, I would say most everything Patently Stupid aims to do is executed very well. Even something like Jean, which is the AI character that joins your game if you start with only three players, works a lot better than I thought it would. He has a set number of things he can submit, but the funny part is that the drawings sometimes work at the prompt, and that can lead to some great moments. I would say the only thing that could potentially ruin the playing experience here isn't even really the game's fault, but it's the option to have the game present your invention for you. It's all presented in a very stock way, and it just seems like an excuse to allow someone not to present if they're feeling nervous or even worse, have muted themselves for the whole game. If someone is so embarrassed that they wouldn't want to talk during a presentation game, then either they shouldn't be playing, or they need that mandatory push of having to present themselves. Being able to talk to an audience is a very important people skill. Games like Jackbox could help individuals be more comfortable with themselves. Again though, I wouldn't really say it's the fault of the game necessarily. That aside, Patently Stupid is a great drawing game and an even better presentation game. It all feels paced relatively well, and whenever Party Pack 5 does get pulled out, this is typically the game that gets played. But that's Party Pack 5. This might seem odd, but I think my biggest problem with 5 is that there aren't any games in this pack that ever have got me or my friends going, aw, oh, we gotta play that one. Because you got one game I think everyone will agree is lackluster. In fact, for all the games like Earwax or Civic Doodle that seem to have its fans, this is probably the one Jackbox game everyone agrees is mediocre. That leaves us with four games, none of which I'd say are bad. In fact, I think they're mostly good. But again, nothing I would personally break out Jack 5 just to play. Games like Quiplash or Trivia Murder Party, people will want to pull out whatever Jackbox just to play those games. Hell, even Jackbox 4, which generally has a bad rep, I've had people who wanted me to pull out just for Survive the Internet or Fibbage Enough About You. But in Pack 5, we have Patently Stupid, which I like, but I definitely know a decent number of people who don't like presentation games. You Don't Know Jack, which is a well done trivia game, but not everyone likes trivia. And even if they do, they'd rather play Murder Party. Madverse City, which can definitely be fun with the right group of friends, but it has too many 
many annoyances like the TTS butchering pronunciations or cutting off verses altogether. And finally, split the room, which as explained earlier, I think it's criminal how such a fantastic idea for our game could have ended up so stale. Not bad, mind you, but it could have been a lot better. So again, with the exception of Zeebledome, no one of these games are bad, and it's likely at least one of these will really click with you and your friend group, but especially with that higher price point that started with this entry. Because this is the first Jackbox game that retailed for 30 bucks, opposed to the previously established $25. It's hard to recommend when, at least among my own friends, the game-to-game -game reception is so mixed. I couldn't pinpoint to a single entry here where I'd be like, oh yeah, that's the game worth buying the entire $30 pack for. I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack for this because I often hear people praise 5 specifically as being one of the best, but I'm sticking with my guns on this one. The Jackbox Party Pack 5 gets a 3.5 out of 5. Pack 5 has some great concepts for games. Madverse City has some of the coolest theming and I think something like Split the room specifically definitely deserves another shot to really flesh out its ideas. But when you're dropping 30 bucks for a collection of party games, how good something is conceptually doesn't really matter when there are visible blemishes scattered across most of these entries. Not a terrible pack, and there is fun to be had, but I would personally recommend packs 2 through 4 before picking up 5. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm sure many of you are wondering why I'm returning the Jackbox, or why I haven't started Season 4 yet. It's a bit complicated, but I'll have an update video here pretty soon. Either way, I am very grateful for my patrons such as Abby Knudsen, Amanda Guth, Cashinator, David Pacheco, Drew Kellenberger, Jeffrey P. Long, John Hancock, Kinslow TN, Michael Moose, Naomi Norbez, Pretoria Mars, and Rami Batter. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, have a good one.